Tonight we are going to begin a study entitled Family Matters. Family Matters. And we are going to be in this study for a while. Now to put it practically, why are we going to be studying this and why are we going to be studying it for a while? Well, simply put, because... Family matters, amen? My goal is as we look at the scripture, my goal is as we go through this study that we would be both intensely biblical and intensely practical in what we do. Because the reality is that we as believers need to know the what, we need to know the why, and we need to know the how of what God has for us. Now, it is generally understood that our families and our homes need help. Amen? I'll spare you the statistics tonight, okay? But it is generally understood that our homes need help. The division, the divorce, the conflict, the neglect, and even the abuse within the home are issues that plague both the homes of believers and non-believers alike in alarming numbers. We need help. To put it simply, we need help. And sometimes we get a little bit concerned because, you know, we, we get married or we go into marriage and everything's lovey-dovey, happy, happy. And, and then we find that there are such things as conflicts or frictions within marriage. And we get all concerned because we realize, wait a minute, I, I, I don't know quite how to handle this. And some people say, well, you know, there's no manual when it comes to marriage. Or we get kids and we think we know it all till we get a kid or two, don't we? And uh, then we think we know all about teenagers until we get a kid or two. And so I, I, we get a kid and we get the problems and we go, wait a minute, there's no manual that comes with the kid. There's just a lot of crying and a lot of screaming and a lot of late nights. I'm going to tell you, that mentality that there's not a manual that comes with it is false. Because we have a manual. God has given us a, a manual for how to do really all things in this life that reflect to godliness and holiness. So tonight we begin. And really, as we go throughout this study, I want to encourage you. Because I want this to be practical and profitable. If there is an aspect or an element of family that you would like to hear taught and preached from the Word of God, communicate that. You can write it on a voice from the pew. You can text me. You can stop me before or after a service and say, hey, have you ever thought about addressing this? Because the whole point of this is to help. The whole point of this is to equip us to be able to live and experience the blessings that God has designed for us because family matters. Family matters. Family matters. And tonight we're going to start by looking at why it matters so much. And so tonight, let's begin by considering the priority of the family. The priority of the family. Roman numeral one, if you're taking notes tonight, I want you to see the formation of the home. And really, that's the passage that we just looked at. Genesis chapter number two, to kind of review, verse 18 tells us this. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make and help meet Fitting, appropriate for him. Jump down to verse 21. The Bible says this. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he woman and brought her 
under the man. Now, jump over back, if you would, to Genesis 1 and verse number 28. Uh, this is a, a, a telling of the creation of man here in chapter 1. It says, And God blessed them, speaking to Adam and Eve, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Keep that up, David, if you would. So whose idea was it? To bring the man and the woman together. It was God's. Very good. Whose idea was it that the man and woman, having come together in holy matrimony, should be fruitful and multiply? God's. You have to understand, if we are going to understand the priority of the family, you have to understand the formation of the home. And it starts by simply acknowledging this, that it was formed. It was purposely formed. God planted the garden in Eden. God formed the man from the dust of the ground. God took the rib from the man. God formed Eve. God brought the man and woman together. God told the man and woman to be fruitful and multiply. The family was instituted by God and by God alone. In fact, when Jesus referenced this very scripture during his earthly ministry, uh, Mark chapter number 10 and beginning in verse number 6, he said this, From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. This is Jesus speaking. For this call shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they, they are no more twain but one flesh. Look at verse number 9. Wherefore, what therefore, what's that next word? God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So, so often we, we come into it with the wrong perspective. We think that boy meets girl or girl meets boy and they fall madly in love and, and they put together a little family. No, 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 no. The family from start to finish, whether it was Adam and Eve in the garden, whether it was the people that Jesus was addressing in his day, or whether it's you and I as we sit right now. Marriage is a matter of what not man has joined together, not what a preacher joins together, not what some judge. Uh, joins together, but what God has joined together, it was formed by God. Now, having said that, we have to understand that the family was not an evolutionary necessity. That one day fictional caveman look around and caveman want pretty. That pretty. And cave woman look around and say, want protected. And so cave man want pretty and cave woman want protected. And, and, and somehow it just kind of all came about to be fooey hogwash garbage. It is not just the happenstance of what has happened along the way. God designed it. God designed it. Therefore, God defines it. And no one but God, including culture, the government, judges, individuals, or the church, has the authority to change it. Because it was formed by God. Now, that's an important point, okay? And I know we think we've got that one down, but can I tell you, that's the one we're going to struggle with the most. That's the one that God designed it and therefore he defines it and therefore he's the one that determines how it ought to work. He's the authority. Mark that down. The formation of the home. It was formed. But I also want you to see this, that it is foundational. Of all the human institutions, God created the family first. And this, church, is not a coincidence. The family was formed first because the family is foundational. 
Now, let me pause right here and give a little aside, give a, give a little caveat, if you would. Now, obviously, the first thing that we see as far as man's relationships was man's relationship with God. That is the primary relationship of importance in every human being's life is our relationship to God. And if our relationship to God is not right, then our relationship to our spouse will not be what it needs to be. And our relationship to our kids won't be what it needs to be. That primary relationship is that relationship to God. And so I want to establish that Jesus made it very clear if you want to come after him, but you don't love him in, above or in preeminence of every other relationship, your wife, your mama, your daddy, your siblings, your children, if the love for Jesus doesn't exceed and isn't preeminent and isn't priority over all those other loves, you cannot be his disciple. So understand that, okay? That is the ultimate foundation. But as far as our earthly institutions go, the family was formed first because the family is foundational. God didn't give Adam a boss. He gave him a wife. And I know sometimes it seems like those are the same thing, but it's not, okay? God didn't give Adam a boss. He gave him a wife. God, when Adam and Eve were brought together, God didn't give them a pastor. He gave them children. He didn't give them a president or a governor. The family was formed first because the family is foundational. I want you to see how the family, how the family helps to form the foundations of all the other institutions. You remember Genesis 1, 28, right? Where God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, uh, that sort of thing. You remember that, right? We just read that. And so that is one of the foundational commands as, as regards to the, to the foundation of the family. Well, when God set about to establish human government, and we recognize that God established human government really in an official capacity following the flood. So when Noah and his family came off of the ark, we generally recognize Genesis chapter 9 in verse number 6 as the establishment of the authority of human government. That whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. And so God is delegating the right to humanity to rule over and impose consequences over fellow man. And so when God goes about to establish human government, do you know what human government is sandwiched in between? It is sandwiched in between reminders of the foundational principles of family. You look at chapter 9 and verse number 1, and what did God say to them? God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, What? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So they step off that ark, and the first thing God reminds them of is the importance of the family and its function. Then we have uh, Genesis 9 and verse number 6, the one about whosoever sheds man's blood, by man's uh, hand shall his blood be shed. You know the verse that comes directly after that? Genesis chapter 9 and verse number 7. He reminds them again, and be ye fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And so we see the premise for human government is sandwiched in between principles of the family. Because really, any society, any government, is only as strong as its homes, as its families. When God went about to establish his plan of redemption, we know the Old Testament, right? The nation of Israel, right? The nation of Israel. And, and, and the nation of Israel came from uh, who was the one that God called out in Genesis chapter 12? It was Abram. Abraham. And God called out Abraham and his 
family. And the covenant promises did what? Got passed from family to family to family to family. Now I want you to notice this. When God was laying out the law, the snapshot of the law that we get, Exodus chapter number 20, we call it the Ten Commandments, or for the Bible scholars in the room, the Decalogue. Commandments 1 through 4 deal with our horizontal relationship, right? You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, who we worship is important, amen? You'll not make any graven image. How we worship is important, Amen? We have, keep, don't blaspheme. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Lord's day and keep it holy. So we have here four commands as God is setting forth this, this, this religion, this way that, that His people might have a relationship with Him. And as He moves from the vertical commands to the horizontal commands, what is the first one on the list? Exodus chapter number 20 and verse number 12 says... Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And so when God moves from vertical to horizontal, what is the number one thing he reminds his people of? The priority of family. Before we ever get to don't bear false witness, before we get to don't steal, before we get to don't covet, before we get to things about purity, uh, purity of mankind, God looks and He reminds us about the priority of the family. Why is it? Because the nation of Israel would only be as strong as her families. And can I make the jump to the church today? That the church, the visible body of Jesus Christ in this day and age, in her local manifestations, is only as strong as her families. I don't think it's any coincidence that one of the qualifications for a pastor is that he must rule his household well. Why? Because the ministry is never going to be any better than the family. First things first. This society will never be stronger than it. You know why our nation is a wreck today? Because our homes are a wreck today. You know why our churches lack the power of God like they should today? Because our homes lack the power of God like they should today. Do you know why our churches lack the leadership that they should today? Because our homes lack the leadership that they should today. Do you know why our churches lack the examples that they should? Because our homes do. Our society and our churches will only be as strong as our families. Tonight, you got to see. You've got to see the priority of the family in the formation of the home. It was formed. And it was formed by God to be foundational. Now, having said that, a couple of facts to take home. Understand this, and this is where it gets practical tonight. Roman numeral two, facts to take home. We need a biblical pursuit. We understand tonight that we do have a manual, amen? That God has given us clear instructions. That God has given us clear instructions. The Bible, the Bible is full I mean, it is chock full of teachings on the home, on the family, on marriage, 
on fatherhood, on motherhood, on child rearing, on what children ought to be doing, on what uh, adolescents, teenagers ought to The Bible is chock full Old Testament and New Testament of Bible truth about the home. There are so many precepts. There are so many principles that we need to attain. And there are so many patterns or examples that we can look to and apply. The Bible is full of family truth. And I'm going to tell you that's good news. Because our society is not. That's good news because Facebook is not. The Bible gives us clear instruction. And in love, I want to point this out tonight. That most of what we operate on, most of what goes on in our homes, and, and I say this with love, I say this looking in the mirror, okay? A lot of what goes on in our homes is not in the Bible. We might pick it up because that's how we were raised. That's what my mama did, or that's what my daddy did, or that's what my grandparents did, or, you know, my friend down the street, she had cool parents, and her parents did this. A lot of what we do, we do because we've seen it done, or it's been done to us. Can I tell you, a lot of what we do as well is based off of cultural pressure. Because this, this is the way things are done these days. A lot of what we accept as foundational principles for our homes are not in the Bible. If I asked you, how do you handle conflict as a family? Would what you say be found in here? If I asked... How you prioritize or handled or grew your marriage. What would you say? You see, most of what we operate on has very little to do with the Word of God. I'm going to tell you even worse, some of what we operate on not only has little to do with the Word of God, some of what we operate on goes directly against the Word of God. How many of us, how many of us have heard it said that they miss the olden days when parents were able to really discipline their children and the olden days when those kids knew their place? How many of us have ever heard that said? Maybe we've said it, maybe we, we wouldn't say it, uh, but uh, maybe somebody around us would say it. And, and you know, what we're really doing is we're lamenting almost this John Wayne-esque authority where you know what? If somebody mouths off, you grab them by the throat or you punch their teeth into the back of their head, you remind them where they belong, they fall in line and, and, and we get the job done. We knew how to get things done. You know what? There are some men who try to lead their home that way. There are some men who did lead their home that way. Some men who do lead their home that way. There are some parents who want to parent that way. Can I tell you, let me ask you this. Is that the kind of leadership that Jesus Christ exhibited or taught? No. Unequivocally, no. And so, you know what? We may have succeeded in outward conformity, but you know what John Wayne-style authoritarianism never accomplished? An inward change of heart. We liked it because it worked, not because it was biblical. That was kind of a old in method. Let me give you a newer method. You know, we live in the day of delegation. We do. Ain't, ain't nothing my job. Not my responsibility. I mean, for instance, if my kid gets sick, whose job is it to make him better? Why, of course, it's the doctor. It's the doctor's job to make him better. My kid needs educated. Whose job is it to make sure my kid's educated? It's the school's job. 
Those stinking schools failing my kid. I can't believe those schools. Mm -mm -mm. My kid, he, he needs some spiritual growth. He's a little rebellious. He doesn't really have an appetite for the things of God. He doesn't know the things of God. Who is it to make sure my kid's spiritual and, and doesn't grow up and die without God and go to hell? Whose job is that? That's the church's job. It's the doctor's job to keep them healthy. It's the school's job. To, I can't even say it with a straight face. To get them educated. It's the church's job to get them saved. <laughs> no. It's your job. It's your job. Mom and dad, you have a teenager, you will stand before God and answer for that teenager, not Dan Utley. You will stand before God and answer for the education of that child, not Melanie Wiesner, not Clyde Greenspring School District. You will stand before God and answer for the physical well-being of that child, not a doctor. God gave that child to you. He gave my children to me. It's my job. But you know what? We live in the age of delegation and it's just so much easier in this day to let the experts do it. It might be easy, but it ain't Bible. We need a biblical pursuit. You know what? Because 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 reminds us this, that in this word, that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And that includes how to be a family. That includes how to do home. He's given it to us. He's given it to me. And so you know what, church? Here's what we got to do. No excuses. We need to study. We need to study to show ourselves approved under God. We need to study. And you know what? When we study, God's going to speak to us. And when God speaks to us, you know what we need to do? We need to submit. No matter what it costs us. We might find that as we study God's word, you find that you cannot do what God has told you to do and keep your job. Do you know what you should do? Do what God told you to do and find a different job. It's as simple as that. That's an extreme example. But you study, God speaks, you submit. And then what do you do? You study some more. And God speaks and you submit. We need a biblical pursuit. If good homes and good families and good marriages and good kids happened by happenstance or happened by accident, they'd be all over the place. But they don't. They happen on purpose. And only when you pursue what works. A biblical pursuit. We need to accept a biblical pursuit. And we also need to accept a biblical perspective. How come I only have two points and I still am long-winded? <laughs> Listen up, because this is important. The Bible's clear. Your family is God's blessing to you. Your family is God's blessing to you. It is not a burden on you. You look at what the Bible says, for instance, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 22, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor from the Lord. Psalm 127 verses 3 through 5 tell us this, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His what? Reward, the Bible says, verse number 4, As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed. They shall speak with the enemies in the gate. And you'll be reminded, Genesis 1, 28, when God first spoke to them about kids, what does it say? It says, and God blessed. Children are just that. A blessing. A blessing. 
some of us are going to need to change the way we view our family. Your spouse is not the hindrance to your happiness. Let me tell you in love, your spouse is the greatest earthly blessing that God has given you towards your earthly happiness. Your children are the greatest reward of the marriage that God has given you. And so if that really is the priority that God has given us, and that really is the great blessing that God has given to us, then here's the practical part. When you get home, your day has just begun. The worst thing in the world you can do is get home, plop on the couch, recliner, pick up a remote, and, and, and watch away the evening. Why? Because in doing that, you are neglecting the greatest blessing that God has given you here on this earth. When you get home, your day has just begun. The best part of your day is when you get home. The work that matters most is when you get home. We are not miserable because of our families. I fully believe that we are miserable because we despise the blessings of our family. Some of us are going to need to change the way we look at our wives, look at our husbands, <coughs> look at our kids. And we'll tell you, we also need to change the way we talk about them. You know how easy our culture has made it to talk poorly about our family? We talk about the old ball and chain. I've heard Christian people refer to children as mistakes or monsters. Well, let me ask you, when we use verbiage like that, whether within our house or whether it's talking to people outside of our house, words are powerful. True or false? What are we speaking into the life of our family? A whole lot of negativity. As Proverbs would say, a whole lot of death. Some of us really need to change the way we talk about our family. I mean, I want you to think with me. When is the last time that you prayed and you just genuinely thanked God for the blessing of your spouse, for the blessing of your children, for the blessing of your grandchildren? When is the last time? And you know, I thought about that. That was convicting. You know, we've prayed about a lot of things for my family. And we've prayed a lot about a lot of things having to do with my family. But when was the last time I stopped and just told God, thank you for my family? Aside from everything else, just recognize the blessing that it was. When's the last time we told our spouse what a blessing they were? When's the last time we, for no reason at all, except to make sure they told our kids what a God-given blessing they were in our homes and lives? I'm going to tell you, we've got to change the way we look at it. We've got to change the way we talk about it. Even now, church, and this is the challenge tonight, we don't have to wait. The challenge is before the night's through. I wonder if we would take some time and go to God, even during the time of invitation we're getting ready to have, and just thank God for the blessing of our family. Not pray that God would change the hearts of our kids or change the hearts of our spouse, but just thank God. For our, if we would take time before we closed our eyes tonight and make sure our family knew what a blessing they were to us. Why? Because family matters. Because family matters. And there is a priority that the Bible places on the home that the church has lost today. And as we begin, really, this study, we have to understand why it matters. It matters. It matters more than your career. Amen? It matters more than your social media. It matters more than your ministry. Family matters. It matters because God formed it, and God formed it to be the foundation of everything else that matters. And that being the case, how could we do anything less than commit ourselves to a biblical pursuit 
and a biblical perspective. Tonight, let's see the priority of family. Father, we love you.